and um, experiencing some difficulties. Anyway, uh, my my uh, hope for 2022 is that um, things somewhat get back to normal and I can travel again. Um, I definitely want to travel and not just to Canada, across the border to see my family, like somewhere far, far away and hot. <laughs> I think a lot of us are, you know, sympathetic to that, Lisa. <laughs> Drew, do you want to go next? Yeah, hi everybody. Drew from the Buffalo Central Terminal Report. I think I'd have to really echo Lisa. I think I'm looking forward to maybe potentially, hopefully, doing some more traveling um, in 2022. Wonderful. Welcome, Drew. Um, Mike Hutchinson. Hi, everybody. Uh, Mike Hutchinson with uh, Broadway Fillmore Neighborhood Housing Services. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit more basic. I'm looking forward to the Bills winning the Super Bowl because I'm a pretty big Bills fan. <laughs> nice. I'm sure there's many other Bills fans here with you, Mike. <laughs> Athena, how about you? Hi, good morning. I'm Athena. Um, I am looking forward to growth. I think that we're gonna come out of this thing growing. So. Um, unfortunately, I still have to travel in this mess. So I was a, a victim of the new Omarion. No, I'm joking. Um, but <laughs> um, yeah, I'm looking forward to change. Yeah. And, and also I'll ask everyone to just share the district that they're um, focused on. I am focusing on the Jefferson District, and we have recently um, started to work on the Business Association. So lifting up the Greater Bay Area, Jefferson Avenue Business Association. Looking forward to that. Wonderful. And Mike and Drew, um, because you guys didn't get a chance to share, I'll let you just jump on the mic again and, and just share your organization or where you're representing. Yeah, we represent the Broadway Fillmore area. Yep, same Broadway Fillmore. Great. Barb? Yes, thanks. Um, Barbara Rowe, um, Vision Niagara. We're concentrating on the uh, Upper Rock area of the Niagara Street Corridor. And um, uh, Lisa, you beat me to it with the travel and everybody else. I, that was the first thing that popped in my mind. And I'm hoping to book something this week for a bicycle trip in Italy, maybe. So we'll see. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yes. Fingers crossed, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Augie, welcome. Good morning. Bright and early for you. It is. It is. Good morning. Um, is it my turn now? Yeah, I'm just asking people to share their name, their organization, and um, something you're looking forward to in 2022, personal or professional. Could be either. Awesome. So um, Augie Gastelum. Um, I am with, uh, I'm the founder of Patchwork Community Inclusion, I'm an, a community and economic development consultant in Mesa, Arizona. Um, and I am looking forward to a Bills Cardinals Super Bowl. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Good morning, Augie. Thanks for joining. Kate, what about you? Um, can you actually hear me? Because I'm still having that trouble. Uh, we can. We can hear you and you're in okay. real time. Um, I agree with everybody. I want to travel more. Um, two years ago, I was supposed to go to Italy <laughs> for my 20th wedding anniversary, and that got canned. And we were supposed to go to Spain and Portugal last year, and that got canned. So I really am. I'm with everybody. I hope we, we get to do more travel. Yeah. I think a lot of people are feeling this way. And I think most of you guys know I'm with Lisk. <laughs> yes, he is with Lisk. Not everybody knows that. So thank you for that. Um, James, we have someone named James with us. Yeah, hey, I'm James Sahaki. I'm the executive director of the Elmwood Village Association. Um, and I guess uh, something that I'm looking forward to, this, uh, I, I started just under a year ago, and we were able to bring back a lot of what we did um, last summer, the, the farmer's market, the Tuesday concerts, porch fest, et cetera. Um, I'm looking forward to things getting better so that we can bring back our events bigger and better 
Um, I think people need to get outside and enjoy life again. And um, we are looking forward to being able to help them do that. Wonderful. Thanks, James, for joining us. Andrea Moppins. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I am Andrea Moppins. I am with Citizens Alliance. We're representing the Jefferson area. And I am looking forward to better weather and the Bills game and traveling. Lovely. <laughs> I think lots of Bills fans here. Um, Cornelius. Good morning, everyone. I'm Cornelius Johnson. I am the executive director of Citizens Alliance, Inc. Um, we are representing the Jefferson Avenue area. And I am looking forward to much of everything everybody else is looking forward to travel. Kate, Italy, I was there a couple of years ago. Beautiful. Enjoyed it. Uh, hope you get a chance to get there and do what you want to do. Uh, and uh, that's it. Wonderful. Thanks, Cornelius. Um, I'm sorry to break the flow, but Kate, do you mind sending the link to Steve and Brandy? I just got an email pop up that they're trying to get in and couldn't. Yep, no problem. And I know you're having tech issues, so that's why I had to yep. jump on the mic and check. Yep, I got it. <laughs> um, Essence, I, I, I know you couldn't jump on the mic earlier. I don't know if you still can. Yep, I'm here. Hi, everyone. Essence Sweat with the UDCDA. I'm looking for more funding and business support, um, funding for businesses, getting these buildings renovated, getting them the support that they need in terms of developing their businesses. Um, I'm just looking for a flow for abundance. Hello. Yeah, let's put that out there and manifest it, huh? Nice essence, love it. Um, Sydney? Why, what's wrong? We can pop back to Sydney if she stepped away. Oh, I got it. I got, I'm in a meeting. Um, what about Maggie? Are you able to jump on or do you? Uh... Yep, I'm here. Um, I just have my little guy with me as a result of, you know, COVID. Um, <laughs> but we're all good. Thank you, Zyra. So um, I am looking forward to the same things as everyone else in 2022. Um, a lot of the travel that I'm hoping to do is connected to celebrating weddings. So a lot of weddings got postponed uh, in the last couple of years. So we have, my husband and I are both in multiple weddings, including my sister's wedding this summer. So lots of celebrating to look forward to. Um, and if anyone doesn't know me, I'm also with Lisk Western New York um, and I work on lending and real estate. <clears throat> and um, I'll also second essence about uh, getting money out the door in 2022. Thanks, Maggie. Lynn, are you able to jump on the line? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? We can. I'm sorry? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. So I'm Lynn Stankowski and I live in and am from Kaiser Town. Yeah, I live in Kaiser Town and I represent Kaiser Town. Um, and I am actually looking forward to the end of this pandemic, a Bills win, and for the Super Bowl, <laughs> and um, traveling. Pandem end of the pandemic, Bills, Cardinals, sports. <laughs> and the travel has been top three of this crowd. Um, Carl, what about you? Uh, Carl Skopinski, Broadway Fillmore. Um, my three things are winning the Mega Millions this year, um, the Sabres stringing together at least three wins in a row, and hopefully someone on this call can get the Gus Macker folks to respond because I'm three times I'm done with these guys. So. Well, good to know that we still have people pushing for that. <laughs> um, Steve, Karna. I know you jumped on a little late. We're just sharing something that you're looking forward to. It could be pro professional, personal, 
and what district you're supporting. Um, Steve Carnath, Broadway Fillmore, Newark Housing Services. Um, three things I'm looking forward to. Um, well, it doesn't have to be three. No, it's, uh, um, I mean, the obvious one is Saturday. Um, going to the game, go to every game. Um, uh, ski season, um, uh, since I've been out of town, you know, sort of getting back into that heavy duty. Um, the start of um, the temporary brewing um, by Buffalo Brewing at uh, 662 Fillmore, the, the former Schreiber Brewery, is huge. And I'll add a fourth, uh, my daughter's wedding in June. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Steve. Yep. Uh, Sydney, are you able to jump on? Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, Sydney, um, part of Citizens Alliance, the Economic Development Director, um, focusing on Jefferson, but Bailey and Fillmore are also within our scope and realm. Um, and I am looking forward to getting um, some projects completed. Um, COVID had slowed things down with getting bids and things like that. So I'm looking forward to having a number of projects completed in 2022. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for sharing. I hope all of our, you know, 22 um, hopes and goals and dreams come true. And thanks for, you know, going through this icebreaker. Um, for those that jumped on late, we, we do have a stacked agenda. So we're not gonna be doing the breakout rooms and all that as we typically do. So we wanted to give some time up front. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and show you the, the lay of the land for today. Let me know if you can see this. Um, Give me a head nod or a, yeah, good, okay, great. So today we're gonna jump into the fifth session of this series about organizational growth and development. Um, this looks like a very linear graph. I will just say up front, this shows 15 plus years of growth and development. And typically all of you know this because you've been doing it. This is a cyclical <laughs> process, uh, but we tried to put this in a way that you know is understandable. We're gonna start at the startup phase um, and have Kate talk a little bit about starting up an organization. We are gonna go into the catalyst phase, growth phase. We will talk more specifically about exploring special assessment districts. As I've heard from many of you that that is something you want to talk more about. Um, and then talking about the ongoing cycle and how this all fits in together. So starting at the startup phase, some considerations. Kate, I will ask Kate to jump on. She has a background in marketing and business administration. She is a lawyer um, and she does our nonprofit support work at LISC Western New York and runs our AmeriCorps program, section $4, does a lot of our grants and contract management work. Kate? Hi, um, and, I, and I will just say I've had a lot of technical issues this morning and it very well may be that um, you either can't see or hear me. So I, I didn't have any um, very formal presentation, uh, mainly because every single entity has to basically do the same thing when they when they start up. Um, the biggest decision is whether you're going to be a for profit or a not for profit. And if you're a not for profit, they're very similar to how you set up a regular business. You have to go through the, the processes of setting up the not for profit everything from a certificate certificate of incorporation to um, getting your nonprofit status in New York State and then applying um, for your status on the federal side to become a 501c3. If that's the way that you're there's multiple ways to do things. If you decide that you don't you can't or don't want to go through that process immediately, you are able to get a fiscal agent that would be able to help you to do that. And I know with some of your groups, because I know some of your groups, you have done that as well. The the big thing is is sitting down and actually planning it, deciding whether you're gonna do it by yourself or you're gonna have legal counsel help you to do that process. It is actually possible to do it on your own. And I know that I have talked to a number of you um, in the past as to how, how to do that because you're interested in forming a, a not-for-profit. Um, you have to have a mission and a vision and you have to get your board of directors uh, together and create a set of bylaws. Um, all of those things need to be done and all of the processes need to be put in place as if you are because you are starting a business you should have a business plan 
in uh, even if it, you're a non for profit. Um, so if you're interested or need needing of any of those materials, I have many, many of the things that you might need. The other piece of this is in particular for your groups, if you are looking to to make a determination as to whether you want to be a member based organization or a non member based organization. Um, some of the, the commercial corridor groups are member based and and they're, they're very it's very specifically done like that but your commercial quarter doesn't necessarily have to be um, member based um, and as we as you move through this process you're going to see um, as as Syrah's going to talk there's different ways to to have a member based organization ver versus a non member based there is some difficulties with member based organizations as well, because it means that your board isn't the only one that can control what's going to happen to the organization. And so there's a complexity when you end up deciding to have members um, have to vote on many of the many of the decisions that uh, are going to have to be made in the future. Once you've established yourself as a nonprofit, both uh, on a state side and um, in the federal tax um, regulations, you can also apply for something called a SAMS, re uh, SAMS registration, which is the federal uh, way to any nonprofit that wants to enter into a federal contract has to have a SAMS um, expiration. It's a free yearly uh, expiration uh, or a free yearly service that the federal government offers, and it allows organizations um, to receive federal funding. Um, I also have instructions on how to do that. It is not always an easy process, um, and it can take a it can take roughly a month um, to to get that. You also um, can get a DUNS number, and I will tell you that that number. Um, my understanding is that they are doing away with that. I don't know how quickly that they will be doing that, but uh, at this point you can also get a DUNS number, which helps um, particularly to, to for organizations. Um, are, they're asked for that number um, many, many times. In order to get any kind of federal funding, including AmeriCorps funding, you need both a SAMS and a, and a DUNS number. You need a SAMS registration and a DUNS number. Um, in order to get section, HUD Section 4 capacity building dollars as an organization, you need a SAMS and a DUNS number. Um, anytime you're receiving any kind of federal funding, and that includes funding that is coming either through the county or the state, they're going to ask for all of that as well. Um, for AmeriCorps, um, it's a wonderful resource for organizations. Um, it provides you know, an individual that is in the learning phase, uh, is interested in community development, wants to provide service, um, but it's also, it, it's incumbent upon the organization to help them mature in that position as well. Generally speaking, for the AmeriCorps, it's a 10-month position, the full-time position. They're 40 hours, they, they provide you between 40 and 42 hours of, of work a week. Um, for those 10 months. So it's a, basically they give you 1,700 hours of service. They are, um, the, the members themselves is eligible for a $20,000 a year stipend. And you as the organization provide um, between 15, between 14 and $15,000 as a match. We do have, and, and again, I can at the end, if somebody is interested in, in getting an AmeriCorps, I, I can provide you with sort of the breakdowns because we have summer placements that are two and a half months that are only a $3,000 match, all the way up to a 10 month uh, position, uh, 1700 hours that they're gonna provide for you, but that's a, a, about $15,000 match. Um, it's a real win-win uh, if you have work that needs to be done but you also don't have maybe the capacity to bring on a full-time employee. Um, maybe you're just an executive director or you're a board, right? You're just a board and you don't have the funds to bring on a full-time employee, but you need some extra work completed. AmeriCorps is a really great way to start the process of bringing somebody in and getting some extra 
um, really hands-on work done. Um, one of the things that I know Syra is going to mention, and it's going to be very important, is your board and your board development. And I know she's going to go into that. One of, the, one of the most important things is to make sure that your board is active. Um, I know for executive directors, <laughs> there's a, a, a love-hate relationship sometimes with their boards, um, but making sure that your board is diverse, interactive, um, really is, is creating um, the support that you need, both if you're the executive director or your volunteers, is, is going to become very, very important. But I know that I only had a very short period of time to give you a, a, a lot of information, um, but if anybody needs more information, needs documents, needs um, just help with that startup process, I, I always take calls and, and meetings one-on-one -on -one where I can provide you with um, a lot of information in, in, you know, in an hour-long meeting. Um, and, and starting up any kind of an organization can be a bit overwhelming. So please feel free to reach out. And uh, most of you guys know how to get a hold of me. And if not, Syra can always pa pass on the information to me. Yeah. And Kate is going to talk a little bit more about board development here shortly. I'm going to ask her to just throw her email in the chat just in case. Um, so moving on to this phase one or the catalyst phase or the startup phase that we're calling it. By the way, I took these phasings from a document that I saw many years ago from the National um, Trust for Historic Preservation around the growth of a Main Street program. And so this is rooted in something. And I do have that file in the box folder that we're going to be sharing with you at the end of today. So you can see it in another form as well. Um, but this catalyst, catalyst or startup phase typically lasts three to five years. And some of the things that you're going to be thinking about for your organizational development is your strategy, developing out what that strategy is, your board development, clarity of roles of board committees and volunteers. Um, and I'm going to actually go a little bit deeper on each of these just to show you more of what that looks like. So you will get this box link and these things will be up on our website later. Um, I have just one, I just put through in one example of what a Main Street program or a organization, a strategy and work plan might look like. Others of you here may have been doing this already or might have another example. And if you do and you wanna share, feel free to email it to me and I'll add it to this link or to this box folder. And then other people can you know, start to see what everybody else is doing locally. Um, but just for a quick rundown, this shows you a overview of a little bit of planning that we did for our district where we started with our mission statement and focusing on the left-hand column here. Is this big enough for people? First of all, me? okay. Um, so starting on the left-hand column, we really did some, some facilitation and visioning of what does the district look like 10 years from now? So not thinking about our organization yet, but really visioning the district. What, and in this particular case, it was a university town. We wanted commercially vibrant, um, you know, no downtown vacancies, increased retail. We wanted to have be a relevant destination town and have a boutique hotel and be a hub for arts and culture and increase our population. So that was in this particular town. The next step that we did was think about, okay, well, for that to happen in 10 years, what needs to happen in five years? And so we visioned around that too and listed out some examples of, you know, we wanted a thriving brewery and more downtown venues for Eastern Oregon University students, et cetera, et cetera, you know, more green spaces and pride. Um, and then to get to that five-year goal, what could we do in one year? Or what, what does downtown look and feel like in one year? Again, not thinking about our organization yet, but about the actual district itself. So you can see, for example, um, increasing connectivity with bike paths between the, the university and the downtown district. Have one piece of public art. Increase the promotion of downtown history. Maybe those are the things that happen in a year. Then shifting to the right-hand column, we talked about, okay, so what would our organization need to look like in 10 years to support that 10 year vision? What would our organization have to be look, look like in five years to support that five year vision? And you can see some of those examples, which is how this really became operational. Um, so I'll, I'll fly through this a little bit, but we took those 
visioning pieces. And if anybody wants to talk deeper about this and how we went through this process, feel free to email me and we can, we can go deeper. Um, but we created these five goals. So promoting the value of the district, creating more reasons for, for people to come there, integrating it with the, the university, having organizational stability, strengthening existing public and private sector partnerships and establishing the identity. So you can see the goals and some of the outcomes or I should say outputs um, that are here on this, this plan. Most of, many of you have been coming to the several previous sessions to this where we talked about promotions, we went deep on business development and we went deep on design. So I'm showing you this just to show you how all of these pieces start to fit together with that organizational strategy. Um, so we had an overarching goal. You can see this first goal here is in alignment with this goal up here. And we said, okay, how are we gonna use our promotional you know, lens? to do this, who's going to do it? In this case, we had committees um, for promotions, for organization, business development, and design. And so this is just an example of how this can operationalize. There's lots of ways to do this. This is certainly not the only way. Um, I just wanted to show you one kind of real life example. And then I also put in a blank document here if you wanted to use a similar template. So you could put in your organization's name and logo, put in your mission statement, there's some prompts here that ask similar questions of what I just shared, um, putting in your goals and again, just work plan sort of stuff. And again, if somebody else has something like this and they wanna share it, feel free and I'll add it to this folder as well. Um, any questions on that before we jump into the board development stuff? Okay, so Let's talk about boards. I will ask Kate to jump back on the line here if she's available to do so. I know she was having some tech issues. Um, I will first just throw up this main, this organizational chart. So this is just an example of what some district charts might look like where they have a board, they have their executive director, they have a district manager. Sometimes the executive director and the district manager are the same. Sometimes there's, you know, in, in some cases of people here, there those are separate. And so all of the stuff that we've been sharing throughout this series, it's not meant for one person to do it alone. Um, it is not meant for the district direct, the district manager to feel overwhelmed that they have to do all of these things. It's how do you mobilize the pieces within your community um, to do, you know, you might have an organization committee that's focused on volunteer development and PR and fundraising for your group. You might have a promotions strategy that has people interested in marketing and image development and retail promotions and special events. You might have a design committee that's looking at public spaces and building improvements and visual merchandising and economic vitality, looking at market research and business assistance, financial assistance, et cetera. So I just wanted to share this because there's some nuances around how um, Main Street organizations function. This is not the same necessarily as if you are like a housing group that has a Main Street program or if you are a CDC with a Main Street program, but this just is an overarching view of um, like if you were a typical kind of Main Street organization standalone. Uh, I would ask maybe Augie even if you had anything to share on that because you are CDC, you're partnering with. Um, yeah, um, so I think all the information um, that you've shared um, uh, till now was super important. And um, I think one of the things, so as you're looking at this, I'm glad you uh, brought this uh, chart back up. Um, as, you're, as you're looking at this and you're looking at committees, um, I think we can all probably relate with um, being over, over committed, right? Over planning, over talking, over all of these things. Um, and although those things are very important, they're critical to the um, long-term health or even possibility of an organization. Um, but as you're looking at this, I think it's also important to, um, one, identify other partner organizations that could, um, help in any of these processes, and two, um, identify the small um, early action projects, and, and this is something that I know Lisk is very um, uh, very familiar with, um, but the, all the, the early action projects, the little tiny things 
that are going to get people excited because um, people don't get excited about going to a meeting, but they'll get excited if something one little thing happens um, from that meeting um, uh, as as you know as little as you know there's a, a you know a fun um, uh, you know corridor meetup that comes from this and and you know it's something fun and not not a, a work type related thing, but just any small early action uh, wins. Art is a huge uh, um, uh, driver of people. And so um, anything related to art that comes from any of these, these things um, is good. But these are like minor, minor things, not over planned things that can just happen and get people excited. Because um, you'll struggle and, and uh, you'll struggle to bring people along um, if you're not giving them these little morsels of fun and wins along the way. Carl, I see your hand up. Do you have a question for Augie? Well, it's not a question as much, but uh, Augie's right on, you know, the, the, point, the point he just made. Um, you need to give people something they can put, you know, can, can get involved with. Um, one of the things I would I would uh, say is when you're picking board members and especially committee members, is make sure they're not already overcommitted in part of other organizations, boards, or whatever. I mean, there might be there might be a few, but there are people that somehow seem to collect boards and organizations like their uh, pieces for a monopoly game. Uh, the more pieces you have, the more you win. Uh, so you got to be really cognizant of that because what will happen is you might potentially pull people in that are overcommitted already and are really not telling you that. The second thing is, and believe it, believe it or not, you need to make sure that people are competent to use technology uh, like Zoom and have the ability to get into meetings and things like that, um, because a lot of this work will be done online. It will be done still probably in the long in the long term um, it, through Zoom and through using technology. And if they haven't been able to master it, and there are people that can't, then it's going to really be impactful on your organization. So those are the points I wanted to make. Thank you. All right. And can can I add one one thing to that? Um, because that 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 burnout and the overcommitted folks is 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 for real. Um, and one of the things, one of the valuable things of these early action projects, um, um, and you know, uh, I'll, I'll use a, a direct example of something recent. Um, we did a, a mural. Um, we had a little bit of funding as an organization um, to uh, to do a community mural, and so we had a community paint day. Um, it was a lot of fun. The people that were involved in the process and the planning were, you know, really excited about it happening, and a lot of people in the neighborhood came out. From those folks in the neighborhood, um, there are now three additional people who want to be involved, who aren't involved in anything. They're not used, they're not the, the, the type that is the, I want to be on a board, I want to be on a committee. They're just people in the neighborhood that don't even know that these things are going on. And so this community mural paint day drew out some of those folks that now are like, how, how do we get involved and engaged in this planning process. Um, and it's for a corridor that is in the process of developing some sort of entity structure, um, like uh, uh, much like um, some of you on this call. Yeah, that's, that's why it's important to get a couple small, easy wins and because it will draw in more people, which as you mentioned, but it also gives um, the folks that are, are have been, you know, volunteering uh, either on a board or um, or in a committee, a, a couple wins to get all juiced up about. Um, if you don't have that, then you're really going to be struggling. Mm -hmm. Thanks, both of you. I see Kate has jumped back on. Kate, are you able to jump on the mic? I can try. <laughs> I can hear you. Can you see my screen? Uh, I can. I can't see anybody else, but I can see your screen. So I'm not sure where you guys are. <laughs> Can you share just high level um, board of director governance roles and responsibilities? Just what are the nuanced things that people need to keep in mind? Governance responsibilities, sure. Um, generally speaking, the governance, re gover 
governance responsibilities are going to be um, making sure that your bylaws are reviewed every two years. Um, they're going to be uh, in charge of any, from a governance perspective, anything legally responsible for the organization, um, making sure, um, you know, various, and, and I, that they're, you're in compliance, basically. Um, the governance re governance committee is not going to be responsible for the audit. That'll be that'll actually be an audit committee. So that's the one piece where um, there is com a compliance issue and requirement, but that would not be um, the governance uh, responsibilities role. Um, governance is also going to be responsible for um, doing a lot of uh, sometimes they're ad hoc projects that need to be done. Um, I've, I've seen them be used to uh, look at various laws to see how it's gonna impact um, the nonprofit. Um, but for the most part, it's making sure that the bylaws are being complied with because that is their legal responsibility. And also if there are any kind of conflict of interest, um, they're gonna be the, the group that's gonna take a look at that and um, making sure that they're in compliance with, with the laws, just briefly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kate. Sorry, I can't see anybody's expression. You guys are all, <laughs> there's there are oh. no people. And so it makes it hard to know if, if anything I've said actually um, has been impacted. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, um, I think I see either a thumbs up or a hand raise. So <laughs> from Carl over here. Um, Kate, can you also share a little bit about a board matrix and what the value of that is? Sure. I think um, the best thing about a board matrix um, is it more than anything, if you have a good matrix, um, which I think Syra does here as a great example, it makes the board think about how they can be um, equitable, um, how they can be just, how they can be diverse in how they think, um, and about who they who they need on their board, um, not just from a representation perspective, but from a skills perspective. When you're dealing with a board of directors, they're you know you you need things from you know somebody who can help raise money people who can, um, who have connections in the community, but also the different skills like human resources, um, legal, accounting, um, you know, a, a business owner. Um, so when you're looking, you, and and I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to obviously go through the entire list that, that, that Syra has, because it'll be available to you. But I think that having a matrix helps you to think about who do we really need and who do we need to really recruit? And I know that I've worked with some organizations that have used board matrixes really effectively because that they they realized, quite frankly, that um, there it was they were serving a community, a very diverse community, but their board did not reflect that diversity. Um, and when I say diversity, it it could be issues of like somebody who is less mobile than someone else. Um, we, we can talk about things like the number of women or the number of people of color. But when we talk diversity, we're talking about so much diversity. We don't want to have all 50 year old men on a board. We want to have, you know, if, if you're dealing in an organization where there's a lot of youth within the community, you may want to have somebody who's a little bit younger. Um, and, and so you, you kind of have to you look at this list and, and figure out from a board perspective where your holes are. And so I think it's always good to have one because it makes you reflect on who you are as an organization. The one nuance that I would add for a place-based organization that this board matrix has is the geographic area of influence. Um, sometimes a board might not be thinking about that as much if it's like a regional group or, you know, for, for many different reasons, but if you are like a corridor entity, you might want to make sure you're having representation from inside the district, from outside the district, from a neighboring district, from the region, you know, a regional representative. You can see I put enter qualifier here. So this is an example. This is in the box link. You can use this and put in your own qualifiers and um, mix and match as, you know, as is relevant to your organization. 
I would add one other thing. For some of our CDCs, they are required to have a certain number of residents that are a part of their board. Um, so that if you are a CDC that is also doing, um, that has that requirement, that would also be one of the qualifiers as well. To uh, Sometimes, it, you know, depending on what your geographic area is, you may have to have a third of your board be within um, the geographic area. That would be, a, this is also be a place to be able to keep track of that as well. Carl, I can't tell if your hand is raised or if it's from before. Just putting that out there. Um, so uh, it seems like it, he's not answering. So it's probably from before. I am gonna jump to the job descriptions so I don't know how many of you have job descriptions for your boards. Again, this is just a good starting place. So if you don't have something like this in place, you can use this as a template. Um, but this goes through some of the requirements for a board of directors member. And then it goes through the officers. So what is the time requirement for the president of the board? What are the additional you know, major job elements? Who do they report to? Having these things really clearly written out, because remember your board members are also volunteers, making sure that they also feel like they know their responsibility and what they are, um, you know, what is expected of them. This goes through vice president, secretary, treasurer as well, but it also shares some categories that you might want to think about for a Main Street organization as far as your board. So it includes, you know, your downtown retailers or professionals that work downtown, property owners in addition to your heads of neighborhood organizations and identified community leaders, residents could be on here too, for sure. Interested community members, school districts. Um, I don't know if I'm missing anything, Augie or Kate, I'll just uh, let you chime in if there is. No, I, I think this is, this is a, um, a, a great list. And I think um, one of the things that uh, I just, wanted to add, and I think you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I think it's important um, for people to think through is um, the knowing what type of organization you want to be and not just uh, for profit nonprofit, but um, uh, Kate mentioned uh, CDCs community development corporations, um, or a bid or just a neighborhood association or a business association, and just knowing where you want to start um, uh, is is super important to really to know how to use all of these tools that are being presented. Um, and um, I would count you all very lucky that all of these tools are being provided um, because the the compilation of all of this information um, is not. Um, most folks trying to start an organization or a, uh, a corridor type organization don't have all, the, all of these tools at hand. So um, you're very lucky. And I'm probably going to borrow some of these um, for some of the folks that we're working here locally. Thanks, Augie. Yeah, this is totally open. It'll be on our website. So even if you're not at this session and you wanna share it with other people, you're welcome to do that too. Um, I'm gonna run through this quickly. Again, I am available for one-on-ones if you wanna go deeper on any of this stuff, but this is just a quick like orientation checklist. What are some of the things you might want to do with new board members as they're coming on? What does a committee checklist look like? Who are likely candidates? Again, we're gonna talk about volunteers a little bit, but it is a two-way street. So you're looking for, you know, it's not just that we are looking for volunteers to fulfill our needs. It's like, what can we do to fulfill their needs too? Um, and so when you're thinking about promotions, you might be thinking about someone like a marketing or advertising professionals that are looking to do that work or civic groups involved in the arts or people who wanna be part of the action, residents, you know? Um, and so this is just an overview of like, who might be likely candidates that you can start thinking about to recruit for committees. There's committee member and chair, you know, roles and responsibilities. So this document, it has a lot of things there for just as a template for you for a starting point. The one last of the thing, things, mm -hmm, sorry, so can I add one thing to that? One, yeah, one of the things that I have noticed with some of the, the groups that I work with is they think that the committees have to be made up of, of all the board members. And no, what, what works the best, I mean, is best practice is for 
one board member to chair the committee and to bring people from outside the board to serve on those committees. One of the things that that then does is it allows for uh, greater participation within the community. And, and the other thing that it will do is when you're looking for a new board member, you can go to the people that were serving on those committees who are enthusiastic about your mission and pull new recruits from those committees. Um, it's also a good place that if you have a board member that is coming off of their time served, sometimes best practices again to have a limit as to the number of years that somebody serves on a board, it's to ask those um, ex board members to possibly serve on a committee. It allows them to still participate in the mission. It allows you to continue to have um, really good, you know, institutional memory. Um, and sometimes, um, as long as they weren't a pain in the neck kind of board member, <laughs> you you want to bring them into the fold. I'm going to take or that one a step further from what Kate said, and also share that I've seen the um, board liaison work really well too, where the committee chair actually might not be a board member, but it allows for the cultivation of leadership. So you might have somebody like Augie just shared, somebody that went to a paint day, was really excited, wanted to join the organization, be involved in some way, they join a committee. Then from there, maybe they are on the committee for a year. And then there's an opportunity to become the, commu the committee chair. And maybe it's not always a board member, but it could be brought up from the committee. But if there's a board liaison, then that communication is still always clear between the board and the committee. And if the committee needs funding resources or X, Y, or Z, they can communicate that. Um, and then a lot of times a committee chair might even approach, you know, board level. So that is a, an example of a leadership pathway of someone that might just, you know, have come to a paint day and, <laughs> and make their way through, um, through that leadership pipeline. So the last thing I want to share here about boards, just as an equity piece, um, I know, you know, for some, especially if you're talking about residents or business owners being on your board right now, especially in this time of the pandemic when there might not be disposable income, um, sometimes that can be prohibitive to being on a board. But this is a really creative way of bringing new board members on with friend raising plans that might ask them to commit a level of time or volunteership. Um, some examples here include like, um, introducing new prospects to the program and strengthening. Why you do? You're bad. <laughs> uh, we we see things like, um, you know, cultivating a donor list or encouraging estate planning or establishing relationships with foundations. So you might be able to find other ways to engage like someone like a business owner or a resident that might not be able to financially fund the board in the same way as others. So I just wanted to share that example. So at this point, oh, um, we do have another, so I'm just gonna fly through this and just show you what's in here because of timing. We do have a committee checklist that shows some of the things that your committees might be looking at you know, things your design committee might be looking at, things your promotions committee. This should all not be, none of this should be totally new um, because we went through each of these in detail over the last four sessions. But this is just here for you to see, you know, again, more of roles and job descriptions and what those committees are, you know, potentially could be doing. Um, we also have examples of committee charters. So, you know, what is the role? This is specific to this specific organization. This could look different for you. Again, this is just a starting point, but what are the programmatic responsibilities of this committee? What are the projects and programs? Um, what are the parameters? I think there's the chair expectation and the board liaison expectations. So this is again, if the chair is different from the board member. Um, and we have that for all of the different types of committees of a typical Main Street style program. For a CDC, this could look different as well. But again, this is just a jumping point for you to use. I know a lot of groups here do spring cleanup. So I included like a tidy up downtown um, charter that has you know, the goals and the purpose and number of volunteers you might need. So thinking through these things ahead of time, block captains, I don't know if people are familiar with that term, 
Um, but you know, if you have a business owner that's extroverted and is already talking to all their neighbors, they might be a really great block captain candidate. So you can help, they, they might be able to help distribute flyers or share news of new grants coming up. You might have a couple touch points out in your district who then can go and touch, you know, share the news with other um, property owners and business owners around them. We also have a college intern and high school intern position description. So I just flew through this. There's a lot of stuff here. Message me if you wanna go deeper on these things, um, but just to keep the ball rolling. At this point in this phase one, the first kind of like three, three to five years, you're really creating a buzz and you're selling a dream. You're asking people, especially funders, to take a leap of faith. Um, so your funding might look like event fundraisers, grassroots, maybe it's things that your residents in the neighborhood want to see happen or businesses band together and want to see happen. Small wins, like what Augie was sharing. Um, and it might look like short term philanthropic, philanthropic pledges. So this might be what a pie chart could look like. I know for um, several groups here, there's, you know, East Side Avenues, there's some funding there for this, for their programs. And so it might look like you have a lot of you know, kind of philanthropic funding for your program, maybe a little bit of community events are starting to happen, you're kicking it off, you're creating that buzz. So moving from catalyst to growth phase, some of the transition indicators, your organization would have a better understanding of the role that you have in the regional economy, because you've done your strategic planning and you've figured out your niche, you've done some of that background work, you might be putting systems into place. Again, I'm going to fly through this just for time's sake, but if you click on this box link for volunteer management, we have a whole lot of tools and materials here for you. There's a guide to volunteer management, um, this whole document, how to work with them, recruiting them, training volunteers, retaining and supporting, recognizing. Recognition is really important. I was always taught that you have to recognize volunteers three ways, three times. Um, so, you know, thinking through some of those things, there's a volunteer handbook for you to look at. So this is this organization provided this to all their volunteers. Volunteers are all ambassadors of your organization. So you at least want them to know your mission statement, know what they're volunteering for, what the greater good is. Um, and this volunteer intake form, I wanted to share this just because again, volunteering is a two way street. So how can we not be you know, pulling teeth and trying to get volunteers in, but how can we be speaking to them in a way where it gives them a purpose and something that they're looking for? So this quadrant, you can see the why's why's. Why did you become a volunteer? You can even do this with your board members, you know, as a kickoff to see like, why did your board members continue to be volunteers with you? What are the skills and talents and interests and hobbies that they bring that they want to do? What are the things they want to learn? So can you provide them with those learning opportunities so that they can grow in their personal development? Taboos, what do you never want to be asked to do? Because you never want to put a volunteer who's giving up their time in a position where they're being asked to do something that they just really don't like, or you know, they wanna stay away from. So that's there for you. There's a volunteer thank you letter as an example. Um, again, just a kickoff point of something that you can use going forward. Volunteer calendars. I'm just gonna highlight quickly in this um, volunteer manual. This is a very bulky document, or uh, yeah, it is a bulky document. I'll just show you in the table of contents, it shows some things around volunteer program design decision phase. How are you deciding on what projects you're gonna do? How many volunteers you need for those? Um, recruiting and screening, managing, assessing. You can see down here on page 82 is something called forms. So I just wanna bring attention to this. Um, if you go to that page, page 82 here, forms. There are several different forms. This is in a Word document format. So you're able to use this for your own organizations if you'd like. Volunteer opportunity forms, bypass volunteer projects. I found this to be really helpful when I was doing this work um, because we could say there were all of these really great ideas, but we didn't have enough staff capacity to do it. And so by collecting that data, you can show that to a funder or you can use that um, to inform you know, your program as you grow. Position descriptions, so we have this for episodic, which means one-time um, volunteers or your midterm volunteers who might be volunteering for a year, maybe a committee member, 
or leadership volunteers. So, you know, committee chairs or board members. So there's a lot of stuff here that you can use and that is available to you. Um, again, I'm gonna fly through this a little bit. Do you have any quick questions on this? Any comments? Okay, well, the last thing I'm gonna share um, before I start passing up the mic to our guest speakers here is idea vetting. So at this point in your organization's growth, you might be really showing some of those small wins. People are like, this is an organization that gets things done. I'm gonna come to them with all of my ideas. But, you know, how do you vet that? Um, how do you figure out, yes, we're going to take on that idea. No, we're not going to take on idea. We don't have the resources for that, but it's a great idea, you know. And so I've provided some resources and tools here for you. Um, this does come from the organization that I once worked for, but the dire executive director that came in after me put all these systems in place with this particular rubrics, um, which is really, really super helpful to see and very handy um, for the artistically and graphically minded people you might like this version which shows you know that you start here there's a person with an idea they're the initiator they fill out an idea form which i will show that to you in a moment and then it goes to the committee chair and the executive director and they consider does it fit the mission is there enough information what's the schedule if it's a yes and it's super easy you bring it back to the initiator and you have them do it um but if it's you know, a no or a not yet, maybe you have to give feedback back to the initiator. So the point is that creating these systems around how you're gonna vet ideas, how you're gonna like really bring them in can, can help your organization in your, when you have resources, when you have limited resources, where are you gonna put them? Um, an idea submission form, the one that I was just sharing could look like this. So you have an initiator, they have a, an idea. Is it a tiny suggestion? Is it a giant idea that needs multiple partners and a significant amount of funding? Is it an art installation, a community event, a business service, a promotional event? What type of idea is it? How is that initiator going to be able to help contribute to making it happen? So instead of people just coming at you and throwing ideas, you ask them and give them some, you know, um, the ability to say, yes, I'm going to coordinate the project. I can provide financial support. I can provide volunteer support. I can sponsor it. I can provide a location. How much will it take? And who else could help this idea come to fruition? What other partnerships are there? And finally, how will all of our stakeholders, our downtown customers and property owners and visitors and our staff, you know, how, how will they be impacted by this idea? So I just think that this is a great sample of, you know, instead of dropping it on you and your board to come up with how you're going to make it happen, giving that power back to the idea initiator to have them develop that idea more and bring it to you. Finally, there are several different rubrics here that you can, again, use as a template. Um, let's try to zoom in a little bit. This is for design. So if you have a design committee, you know, you're, and you want to score ideas, you can look at, well, how does it reinforce downtown's identity? Is there current community support? Is there current stakeholder support? What is the visibility of the project? What is the threat of inaction? If we don't do this, is this a public safety issue? Is this going to be an infrastructure issue? Um, the cost, inclusivity, you can read, you know, down the line. But these are all here for you as well. So there's, you know, all of these different committees that we've talked about over the last four sessions. Um, those are all here. And it all wraps up with this final template that shows, you know, what ideas were proposed, what is currently pending, what was completed. We did it. And either it has to happen again or we decided we're not going to do it again. It was a great one off. You know, um, is it ongoing? We, we tried it and it's turned into an ongoing program because it was so successful. Um, was it shelved because you didn't have enough resources for it at the time? Was it, is it expired? Like it was really good for this moment in time, but now that moment is kind of passed. So now it's expired. So this is just showing you an example of how another organization has put some of those systems in place that you might start to be thinking about yourselves as you're transitioning from the catalyst to the growth phase. And as you're doing all of the small successes, you know, they're adding up, they're making future fundraising easier for you. So a couple of things to look out for in this catalyst phase, in your startup start to growth phase, you're going to have, you know, those energetic and visionary leaders where 
um, burnout could be high. The risk is high. And so broadening your participation is really important in this phase, making sure you're building those partnerships with other organizations, bringing in volunteers, and not underestimating the small wins. So instead of spinning gears on how do we redevelop that huge building, you know, how do you show those credible little successes along the way so that you can get there? And finally, not forgetting to align with a strategy and vision that can really carve out the niche that your organization plays in the bigger ecosystem. I'm going to pause here and see if Augie or Lisa or any of our other speakers have anything to share on this before we move on. I don't have anything uh, at this time, uh, Syrah. I think, uh, you know, this is uh, definitely a good summary of, uh, you know, the things to look out for in the space. So I don't have much to add. Uh, Augie, may, Augie may have some, some additional insights. Um, I think I just, the, the only thing I want to highlight, not necessarily add, is don't underestimate the small wins. Um, the small wins are actually big wins because, um, uh, um, one, you're never going to get to a big win without a hundred small wins. Um, so celebrate those. Someone, I think Carl uh, put in into the chat um, that if you're not getting your stuff out there, your, your wins out there, you're doing the organization a disservice or you're doing yourself a disservice, um, getting that information out to potential funders. Um, these little tiny things, what we would consider, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, insignificant, um, mean a lot to funders that when they see this momentum and these wins are happening, um, on a weekly, on a monthly basis where you're putting these things out there, look at what we're doing, look at how we're, this is impacting, look at, um, you know, what effect this is having, um, all of those things will get funders excited about, uh, joining in on that momentum. Um, they, uh, no funder wants to fund a stale um, uh, organization or or something that's just not seeing results. Um, and I mean, don't underestimate the size of the win either. Um, they're 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 all um, they're all big. So I'm I'm very very passionate about this particular piece because it's very overlooked by a lot of organizations. Yeah, I love that. It takes a hundred small wins to get to a big win. <laughs> That's a great quote, Augie. So at this phase, we are moving into the growth phase, which typically lasts five to 10 years for a lot of organizations. And so you're using lessons learned to tackle those bigger issues, redeveloping. So those small wins, those hundreds of small wins that are happening in those first three to five years of your catalyst phase, you can now, you know, you're proving some of the value of your organization. Others are looking at your organization as one that's getting things done. You might be looking at business development and working more with the businesses on very tangible, very specific things. Business recruitment might start to show up at this phase. And you might start to think about business membership um, because you may have be sh maybe showing value to businesses in the sense that they say, oh, this organization is here and my sales are increasing or I'm able to stay here because they've provided some technical support or have provided funding or redirected grants to me, right? And so as those things are starting to happen, you might consider a business membership um, approach. And so I'm not gonna go through all of these. I'm just gonna share that there is a guide here to a successful business membership campaign. What are the steps, who to, you know, meeting the member, handling objections, positive closure, communicating with them. Um, again, if you wanna go deeper on any of these things, I do have time allotted to do that with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. This handbook is turning supporters into donors. So this is also looking more on a broader scale of individual investors, business investors, supporting documents. There's a lot of tools here for you to use. Um, the one, and the final thing I'm going to highlight here, I wish we could go deeper. I feel like we could do a whole session on each of these things, on volunteership, on business membership. Um, but the, the final thing I want to highlight is that people do this in different ways. So it really is just based on what works for you. This particular example, the business association prorated their business membership, where they said, if you join between January and March, this is your dues. If you join during this time, this is your dues. If you join in October or December, 
you're paying $37, right? So that there's a prorated approach. There are some approaches where there is a more of a tiered approach. So in this example, you could see that there was like four tiers and depending on what you wanted to, um, you know, provide to the organization, there were several different services that you receive. In this particular example, the Main Street organization was asking for uh, sponsorships for all of their events too. So they were only asking businesses once. So if you ended up being a gold member, you could choose two events to sponsor. If you were platinum, you got your name on everything that that organization did. And some of that funding from the membership would be allocated towards those programs. So that's just a way that you can think about like allocating funds. Hey, Syra, can I just um, just briefly interrupt and, and indicate that there is a difference between what you're saying now and being a member of an organization versus what we originally talked about way in the beginning as determining whether you're going to be a membership based board, meaning you, you can you can decide that your bylaws are going to include members versus not include members. And and I th that can that doesn't necessarily need to translate into this piece of it, if that makes sense. And yeah, I don't I want people to get them confused. No, that's a great distinction. I think Kate's membership, what Kate is talking about with membership is like typical of a chamber of commerce where they have very specific business members. They might not be a C3. I think it's a, Kate, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it a C6 or C4? I, I never, I, I think it's a C4, but I never I remember. I always have to look it up. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I can hardly keep them all in my mind too. Um, but that's a different structure than a C3. In this type of business membership, the distinction is that you do have to provide a service to all of the district. You can't specifically say we're only going to support people that are our members. You have to be proving that your service is supportive of all of the, of the entire geography, but you can also add this level of membership where there is a like fee for service type of deal. Um, so there is a distinction there. It is nuanced. Again, talk to myself or Kate if you want to go deeper on that. There are also examples here of membership styles where they are basing it on number of employees. So if you have like one to five employees, there's a certain rate. If it's 10 plus, there's a certain rate. So I just wanted to share that there's a lot of different ways of going about it. If your organization is thinking about this, or if you're on that in that position to be thinking about it, um, do reach out and we can, we can chat more. Um, and finally, I do have a couple more materials here around events and sponsorship. I will just highlight two that are recent, that are post pandemic. So there's an example here from December, 2021 of an organization that is probably more than 10 years in their, um, in their growth. And they decided to do a fund fundraising initiative for, um, they called it the funding partners. And they tried to reach $100,000 and they've already reached $70,000 of their goal by targeting anchor institutions. And by really making the case to those universities and medical fields. So at this stage, once you're showing a lot of those wins, you might be able to go and approach them and say, this is supportive of your employees. This is supporting the workforce that is working in this neighborhood. Um, and so I'm not going to go deep into this, but I could make connections. If you want to you know, reach out to this executive director, uh, I can make a connection for you. Um, and finally, I just want to highlight this because I think it's, it's a creative way of putting all of your opportunities in one place. This is 2022, so just released, hot off the presses, from an organization that put all of their, you know, their, their spring cleanup, their tidy up downtown, and their window takeovers. The businesses here loved the artist window takeovers, and I will say that this was a very small win um, that we had started way back when, and it started with bringing high schoolers in to just paint windows around Christmas time, but it has grown into a bigger thing. And so now you can see they're looking for sponsors at the $6,000 level. So this is the way that some of those small wins grow into some of the bigger wins. Um, they put all of these different opportunities in one location, downtown dollars, or I don't know if that's something that people have been seeing around here, but, um, you can do that for, it's a great thing for employees in a district, especially if you're in a district that has a lot of anchor institutions around it. You know, how can you get people to spend locally? They're doing a BOGO, buy one, get one um, around downtown dollars and sponsorship of them. 
So again, this is here for you. Uh, I do wanna keep moving because I know that there's a lot of questions around the bid conversation. So just so, just so you all know that this is all here, reach out if you wanna go deeper one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but at this point, you know, last pie chart, you saw that there was two colors. So now there might be more colors. There might be your events bringing in some money. You might have business membership if you decide to go that route. Phil philanthropy might still be funding some things. You might have just project grants that are in and out. You get something to do a specific thing and then, you, and then it's out. Um, and sponsorships or annual appeals. So those, this is how your, your pie chart might look like at the end of that growth phase. Okay, so now we're gonna move into special assessments and transitioning to a staff funded organization. So at this point, your organization has broad community support. People know what you do. They know what your niche is. You have business support. So relationships have been made. There's a correlation of your organization's existence and business growth. Um, there's property owner support. So, or maybe not even support, but you have your property inventories. You know who's there. You have business inventories. Um, either the relationships are made or they're attainable because you have relationships with the businesses inside of those buildings. And so before I hand this off to our guest speakers, and I'll stop talking for a while, um, I just wanted to share a couple tools and resources that we have compiled for you. So Maggie on our call, thank you for um, helping me find this tool. This is very specific to New York State. And this is a document that was revised April 2006. So it's outdated. Forget about that for a moment and just Keep in mind that this tool shows you um, some of the step-by-step -step process of establishing a bid, you know, understanding is a bid right for your community. So it, it helps you walk through some of those pieces. And then beyond that, beyond all of the text, you'll see that it actually outlines all of the bids that in 2006 were in New York. So the Western region, it shows you um, who was the manager there? What events were they doing? What was their annual budget? What was their assessment formula? What were their revenue sources outside of the bid? And what was the salary for the bid manager? And so I just think that this is a great way of just uh, like seeing what other people have been doing regionally so that you can kind of set yours up and have an example to go through. Um, and the final thing that I wanted to just highlight is this A to Z of bids link. This is through Project for Public Spaces. They've put an A to Z of business improvement districts. Um, and this starting a bid step-by-step -step guide, I think it's probably the most digestible uh, guidebook that I have found on how to start a bid and really walking people through, you know, what is it? Is it right for you based on the property type? What are the assessments that are typical? Um, I know that green text is a little bit hard to read, but you know you can open it up on your own screens if this is something that you are looking at exploring. What are you doing in the planning phase? What are you doing in the outreach phase? What is the legislative authorization? So this is a really great, you know, just very functional tool that I wanted to just highlight was here for you. Um, but now I am going to stop talking and move on over to our speakers. So Augustine Augi Gastelum founder of Patchwork Community Inclusion has already, you know, chimed in several times. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask Augie to share a little bit about how you're working with bids and CDCs and shared leadership and shared partnership from the community perspective. Awesome. <clears throat> so thank you. Um, um, so a lot of the, um, I'll, I'll kind of provide a little bit of context of the, the area um, that uh, I do most of my work in here in Arizona. Um, and it's a light rail corridor uh, that connects uh, the city of Phoenix, the city of Tempe, and the city of Mesa. <clears throat> and um, my work primarily is focused in Mesa and in Tempe. Um, they are neighboring cities. And um, as, a, as a whole, the, the commercial corridor that this light rail stretches is about six miles. Um, so it, it's a it's a fairly as a commercial corridor. It's a really large area. Um, it's actually a um, a series of commercial corridors is the way that 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 we look at it. Within this commercial uh, or within this stretch, there are two bids. Um, there is the Downtown Mesa Association and uh, Downtown Tempe um, Association. 
Um, and so uh, this, uh, the light rail connects these two downtowns. And um, much of my work is with a CDC that, with a, a community development corporation that works uh, kind of in the areas between these two bids. Um, I am a huge proponent of um, identifying partner organizations like a bid and a CDC. They work very hand in hand, or very well hand in hand. Um, and if there's a CDFI in the in the area, um, uh, like LISC or or smaller CDFIs that do micro lending, um, that is another incredible uh, partner organization for you to to be thinking about. Um, and the the important piece of working with these multiple organizations is first, um, as organizations, um, identifying really where your strengths are, where your core, um, the, the core pieces of what you what you do or what you can do are. And um, in the case, uh, I'm going to use uh, Downtown Mesa as, uh, as one example, um, the Downtown Mesa Association, their core functions are, um, as a bid, they are to promote the downtown. Um, they are to uh, create events in the downtown and um, to support uh, uh, support businesses in um, um, in just bringing them together um, and to keep uh, clean and safe. Um, clean and safe is one of the big things that that um, I think most bids uh, um, have a focus on, and and that's uh, the same case here. Um, so those are the areas where the where the bid focuses. Um, Rail CDC um, has a number of programs that sort of go hand in hand with um, with those support services that the Downtown Mesa Association has. Um, Rail has a uh, business technical assistance program. It's the Equitable Small Business Technical Assistance Program. Um, we like to have big long names of things to things. Um, and uh, but essentially, this is this is a, a technical assistance program um, that um, helps uh, that has a, a number of consultants. Currently, we have twenty one different consultants that focus on different parts of business operations. Um, there's a number of consultants that are finance focused. Uh, there's a number of them that are op operations. There are a couple of restaurant consultants. There's uh, marketing consultants. And so these consultants are deployed to work with the small businesses on the specific um, need that those small businesses have. Because Rail already has this infrastructure and this, this program in place, the Downtown Mesa Association doesn't have to um, focus any of its time and attention to really um, work on the business operations or the business uh, side of those businesses in the downtown. Um, and uh, in, in a similar way, rail doesn't, in the downtown area, doesn't really have to think about or focus on the promotion of downtown. Um, and um, uh, because that's something that the Downtown Mesa Association does. We don't have to think about the, the keeping the area clean, uh, keeping uh, doing the, the window display programs, which is uh, something that we've done here as well. We actually do that in partnership with the Downtown Mesa Association. Um, one of the things that RAIL does is uh, uh, organizes small businesses. Um, and, and so we have merchant meetings, we have, uh, we bring the businesses together on a regular basis um, to meet and talk about the needs. Um, and as we identify those needs, we see, we look at, is this something that rail can do? Is this something that uh, is under the responsibility of the Downtown Mesa Association? And based on that, we either collaborate on, on programs like the, the window program um, or a facade improvement program. And, um, uh, and, and we do it together so that they're, you know, we're using less of our resources in this area um, for those things. One of the great things about these sorts of partnerships is that these little projects that start as minor, um, I'll use the facade improvement, actually the window improvement program that then grew into a facade improvement program. Um, uh, and the facade improvement program was minor. I mean, it was like $1,000 grants to the small businesses to do something, just 
do something. Or um, the, I think the grants got up to five thousand dollars was the the biggest grants that we that we ever did as a part of the the facade improvement program. That facade improvement program, the city then took that, and they are now. Uh, 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 doing larger facade improvement programs where they're providing $50,000. But it grew from this window program that grew into the facade improvement program that is now something that the city is funding at a much, much larger level. And there's been some, I mean, full building renovations that, that have happened um, with $50,000 of city support and then uh, the property owner um, doing the rest. Um, so these things grow. And this is something that has happened over the course of 12 years. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight. Um, one of the um, the other areas is um, in those the the districts that do not have a bid. Um, so adjacent to the downtown is the Distrito Latino uh, or the Latino district um, that was not an identified district. It was, you know, we would have merchant meetings with all the L Latino businesses and we do do it in Spanish. Um, and over time, um, they realized that they wanted an identity. And so we helped them develop an identity. There's no one that focuses on the marketing of that area. And so we help those businesses um, come up with, um, uh, with an identity. Um, and same thing on the other side of downtown is the Asian district. We did the same thing uh, there uh, and working with them to develop a brand and an identity. And same thing in Tempe on Apache Boulevard, help the, those that group of businesses develop a brand and an identity and when i say like develop a brand and identity i think often people think about these big projects these big like branding campaigns and these big uh, uh long drawn out um processes and expensive um this was this was a a, a series of meetings with business owners to talk about the highlights what are the things that really draw people what are the things that are the, the 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 anchors of this uh, corridor, and then we paid an artist, a local artist, to de design something based around those key principles, and that logo cost us two hundred and fifty dollars, and we just developed a logo. Um, and if if you give me the uh, a screen share, I, I wasn't able to send some of uh, some of these things, but I can kind of go through. Um, um, some of the the different areas uh, that we that we've done this in, and um, and the um, let me um, I might have to make you uh, a host, Kate. Do you know the? Um, I should be able to make him. I just I went ahead and did it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you should be. I don't think I can't. Button. I think because I made you the host, I can't. Augie, let me know if you're able to screen. Um, I, yes. Um, let me. Oh. I might be having issues on my end. Um, because you want to send me like the the links in the ah, chat, and actually, then I can put them up. Yeah, I can. I can do that. Um. Sorry, folks, let me. All right, there we go. I just shared it through the chat and it's just a, a slide. Uh, let me make sure that you have access. Yep, okay. So um, um, in, the, uh, in the downtown area, um, the Downtown Mesa Association has its branding and its, and its uh, uh, logo and, and all of those things. But we um, uh, developed these different, um, I wouldn't even call them campaigns, just different brand identities um, to promote the downtown. At the, at the time that this happened, uh, Downtown Mesa was on nobody's radar. I mean, it was, uh, uh, if you look at this one on the right, it's, uh, it says Downtown Mesa, if you knew it, you'd do it. It says that because literally nobody knew that anything was happening in downtown no matter how much we celebrated all of our tiny little wins. And so we started telling people, if you knew it, you'd do it. You'd come, you'd be here. If you knew that this was happening, we're trying to tell you that it's happening. Um, and uh, um, the, the Echo and Mesa uh, is something that we developed 
to get businesses to put on their any of the makers in the in the corridor um, to put on their uh, uh, packaging so that because it, it was made in Mesa and that uh, we designed a little uh, downtown Mesa light bulb. This is a great idea and and started putting these things on stickers on shirts and just grassroots getting it out there. It was not I mean, it took us a week and it, a couple of hundred bucks to to buy stickers and buy some shirts um, and very, very, very grassroots. If you click on the second one, um, this spice trail um, is uh, uh, was developed in on in uh, Apache on Apache Boulevard in Tempe and the Asian district in Mesa, that whole corridor, as we started working with the businesses there, it's a very, very cultural uh, corridor with a lot of um, Asian, Middle Eastern, um, um, uh, Indi Indian, a, a lot of restaurants and markets that are uh, um, from, from that region. And so we developed a spice trail um, type of brand and then did some food crawls and and things like that some events based around that um and again we paid an artist in the in the community to design this um and i think we paid this uh this artist yeah 250 dollars and and just just get it out there just it doesn't have to be a formal organized um uh type of thing uh it's, and if you click on on the next one uh only on apache very simple um, we realized that the unique thing about Apache Boulevard is that there's a lot of things that are only on Apache Boulevard. Um, and so we, uh, we just developed a really simple logo really quick, uh, uh, designed some shirts. Um, and, you know, we want people to be promoting uh, our places um, just as they're walking around. So we like to put things on shirts <laughs> and, and just uh, um, get that out there. And same thing with the Distrito Latino. This is the newest one. And this was designed by a tattoo artist in the corridor um, who is also a muralist. And now the, the community mural that was uh, uh, that I mentioned just uh, earlier, um, he is putting this on the mural. Um, the mural depicts a lot of the things that are happening on the corridor, um, but then this will be the first really like major stamp of this Distrito Latino on the corridor. All of these things are a part of those little tiny wins and um, and and they they happen somewhat organically um, and uh, in in some cases in partnership with uh, the partner organizations. Um, but it just don't be afraid to try and iterate and change and improve um, uh, just keep things moving um, and, um, and, and and identify the strengths of what organizations can do um, and how they can uh, support each other in in what they're doing. Um, and so I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at uh, leave it there. And I know Lisa's going to go over some of the really the nitty gritty stuff. <laughs> um, and then we can we can kind of um, bounce uh, from there. Augie, let me just ask you one question while we're here. Are all of these um, brands in that six mile stretch? Yes, they are. Um, okay. Yep, it goes, if you're looking at it, let's say from east to west, it goes the Distrito Latino, it, then the um, downtown Mesa, and then the uh, Mesa Asian District, which is a part of the Spice Trail, and then Apache Boulevard um, in Tempe, which uh, is, a part of the spice trail but also its own uh independent brand so the, and they're all connected um they all have a, a slightly different identity even when you are just present there um and 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 then the downtown tempe association is past apache so it's just it just passed it um and um and so yeah it's just a series of commercial corridors nice well, with that, I'm going, I know there's probably some questions for Augie, but let's let Lisa go ahead and then we'll have questions for both speakers uh, at the end. So Lisa Hicks. Yeah, so 
Thank you so much, Syra, um, and everyone. Um, so I work for um, the city of Buffalo in the mayor's office of strategic planning. And um, you'll see uh, once I start going through some of the um, nitty gritty, as Augie put it, of bids, um, you know, the city does have uh, some involvement uh, with the formation um, of bids and the administration of them. So um, that's uh, essentially what, you know, my department would uh, work with you on if you were in the process of setting up a bid. And I'll go through some of that information as well. I've been with the city for about a year and a half. Uh, prior to that, I've worked for uh, commercial development firms, uh, both here in Buffalo and I'm originally from Ontario. Um, so, um, you know, in the last year and a half, I have not done a ton of work with bids, but there have been uh, a number of discussions, which I see some of you that are uh, on the call today have had discussions with other city folks uh, that were in my position previously. Um, so I'll be picking up on those discussions with you at some point. And again, I'm uh, a resource uh, to all of you. So um, if you don't have my email information, I'll put it in the chat before the end of the uh, the session and you know I encourage you to reach out with any questions that you might have on the process and you know where you might be in the process so so I'll just continue then I guess um so um just just to make sure everyone's clear on on the purpose of business improvement districts um and also just to take a quick step back, uh, the document that Cyrus shared uh, previously uh, that was from the uh, New York State Conference of Mayors, it was dated in 2006. I actually reviewed that in, in great detail uh, because it was very specific to our region. Um, and a lot of that information is still relevant. There's a couple of pieces that, you know, may need some uh, updating, but for the most part, you know, the process that's laid out there is, is very, very relevant and is, is exactly the process that you would need to follow um, to set up a bid. So um, just reminding everyone though, that the purpose is uh, to, you know, define uh, an area geographically uh, and, and to restore and promote the businesses, the business activities within that district. Um, it has to enhance and supplement services that the city is not uh, already providing. So it can't really replace anything that's currently being done by the city. And um, that's a really important caveat when you start to think about, you know, what types of services might be provided within that district. Um, also, uh, just in conversations with others, uh, you know, as I was preparing for this today, um, they, they wanted me to remind you all that bids are uh, incredible um, in a lot of ways. Um, it's a great way to kind of bring uh, property owners and businesses together to form a stronger voice for your district and your neighborhoods. Um, it also, you know, increases property values and things like that. But um, the main thing to think about is just the collaboration with the other groups, um, with the other uh, business owners, uh, or sorry, property owners and, and, and tenants within the district, and utilizing that voice to really just grow uh, your mission for, for, for your district. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Um, in terms of forming the bid, bids are established through uh, general municipal law. It's uh, Article 19A. And for the city of Buffalo uh, specifically, I'm not sure about other municipalities, but for the city of Buffalo, um, this has already been enacted through the city's charter. So, you know, bids are permissible and there's no real work to do on that end uh, in terms of, you know, uh, going through common council and requesting that, you know, the city adopt a bid uh, policy. It's already there. Um, so the next thing you would need to do is kind of you know, identify a district and then determine the needs within that district. Um, once you've determined the needs, you need to really try and determine uh, how those the bid could address those needs in, in a, a financially feasible way, in the most efficient way possible. Um, what's recommended is that, you know, you engage the community, you engage stakeholders, you engage property owners, businesses, and things like that, just to get a really good uh, idea. Um, and all of those um, surveys and anecdotal evidence uh, needs to be provided as documentation as you move through the process. So just having the desire to set up a bid isn't really enough. You have to do a lot of uh, groundwork uh, in advance of, you know, moving through the process. Um, and then once again, I mentioned, you know, it needs to be adopted through the city code, which it's already been done. Um, and then you need to prepare uh, a plan. 
So the plan would be, uh, you know, the district map uh, indicating, you know, where exactly the district uh, would run from, what, what radius uh, you would use and, and the boundaries of the district. And then there's also like a series of uh, written reports uh, indicating, you know, the proposed uh, uses within the district of, you know, the, the different services that um, you would want to have provide, uh, you'd want to provide within the district. So maintenance and operation needs. Also, uh, you'd have to document, you know, how you're going to fund, you um, the 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 um the bid and also you know schedules for implementing plans and things like that um you also uh this plan this plan once it's generated it has it has to then again be adopted through uh the city of buffalo's common council and and likely through uh you know any municipal government clerk's office or, or something of that sort for other municipalities but it would have to go through common council again and then you'd have to, uh, you know, provide notice. There's some uh, publications that need to be made through like official uh, city publications. There's a public hearing um, that needs to actually happen as well. And then there's a period of time where, you know, property owners uh, can file objections to the formation of the bid. So you have to allow them a period of time to object. Um, and then from there, there's a local administrative determination. And so that, again, Common Council would review any potential objections. Um, and they would want to make sure that, you know, you followed all of the municipal rules that were laid out in formation of the bid, that you had, uh, that you followed, you know, the public hearing rules. Um, and also that, you know, this bid is actually in the best interest of the municipality. Um, after that, it goes through to the New York State Comptroller's Office for review, and then there's a final filing with Common Council uh, once everything is approved. So that's basically, you know, just a step-by-step -step process. But then, um, looking at, you know, the, the the uses for the funds that are uh, generated to finance the bid, um, there's pretty much two general categories. Uh, one is uh, to provide improvements um, within the bid uh, that will restore or promote business activity. And then the other general category is uh, to provide services for the enjoyment and protection of the public and promotion and enhancement of the district. So there's certain things and some of that information actually is laid out in that document and, and other documents that Syra provided to you. Um, but uh, it gives you a general idea of the two categories that you can kind of use funding for. Um, so then in terms of your sources of funding for bids, so obviously there's the assessments that are uh, levied on property owners within the district. Um, there are limitations with respect to the amount of the, um, the taxes levied, or, I'm sorry, it's not taxes, it's a special assessment, and that's something that we have to keep in mind in terms of terminology. It's not a tax, it's a special assessment, um, but the, the, the assessment is collected in the same way that taxes are collected for property owners. So it would appear on your tax bill, but it's a special assessment. Um, anyway, there's, there's, uh, there's special uh, limitations on you know, the total amount that you can, you can try to um, uh, levy on property owners uh, to generate funds for your bid. Um, other sources of funding though, and I think this was brought up in uh, several slides ago as Syra was kind of going through the process in the early phases, there's you know, fundraising and donations you could potentially get grants from state or federal government. And then there's also private institutions that you know, like to uh, provide some uh, resources to your bid as well. And uh, in one of those documents uh, that Cyra provided, they also talk about, um, which I think is really interesting, uh, a, finan a financial model that allows a bid to kind of generate uh, revenue through fees. Um, and um, one of the ones I thought was interesting that they mentioned was like a revolving loan fund uh, for small businesses. So um, that's something that, you know, your bid may want to explore depending on, you know, um, the size of your, your bid and, and the level of sophistication of the members on the board. It may be something that you want to explore to kind of generate some um, uh, uh, reoccurring income uh, coming back in besides the, uh, the, 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 um, the assessment, the special assessment, um, but also you could you could generate fees through like festivals and fairs and, and other things like that. So in terms of operations, um, the nonprofit entity, which we talked a great deal about earlier, so I won't go into any detail, but essentially a nonprofit entity has to be formed and um, property owners have to make up a majority of that board. 
And the board is basically subject to, you know, the, the general rules and regulations of any nonprofit board. Um, so I'll just kind of leave it at that because there's a ton of information with respect to, to boards there. And we also have uh, Kate here, who's an expert who can give you some assistance with that as well. Um, so sample operational budget items that you would uh, include as you're starting to think about um, forming a bid. Um, so in terms of expenses, it's gonna be, you know, maintenance and service contracts, uh, administrative and office management costs. And then one thing that uh, needs to be heavily considered is staffing, um, because depending on how you want to organize uh, your bid, you definitely will need a staff person. And I think that was indicated on one of the images that Cyra put up. There's always a cost that has to be allocated to staffing to make sure that the bid is running uh, effectively and efficiently and someone's maintaining the contracts and and following through liaising with businesses uh, and property owners as well. Um, in terms of revenue, I think I mentioned, you know, quite a few of them, the assessment donations, uh, grants, that type of thing. So you're going to want to list that as a projection in your budget when you're starting to look at, um, you know, uh, forming your bid. Um, so now I'm just going to move to the role of the municipality. Um, so the city uh, does play a role, uh, not so much in the formation of the board itself um, and, you know, determining the bid boundaries, but we could potentially from a consultation, consultation and planning perspective, assist with the boundary. And, um, you know, this, this would be something like, you know, sitting with maybe the director of planning, outlining, you know, where you'd like to, uh, where your bid boundary would be and us kind of giving you some, some information and, and foresight into you know, new projects that are coming up or new uh, developments that are coming up where you may want to actually expand your boundary to include some additional property. So things like that, we can, we can uh, certainly play a role um, in, in the formation of the bid. There's also, uh, of course, gonna be legal oversight. Um, so the legal department at the city uh, would you know, verify that you're kind of in compliance with general municipal law but also they would have to play a role in the administration of legal agreements uh, governing the bid and, and things like that. Um, there's also the taxation and assessment department. Um, so they would assist with you know, determining uh, what that special assessment would be, the formula, the calculation, uh, all of that. Um, and then on top of that, um, there are certain properties that may exist within your district that are tax exempt. So you would need to have an understanding of what that means uh, for your overall um, uh, uh, assessment levy that you'd be levy levying on the property owners. Um, there's also the Department of Public Works uh, that you may be uh, involved with in terms of permits um, and things like that. There's the real estate department if there are any uh, city owned properties within your district um, uh, that you know, you'd, you'd wanna consider. So, I think, um, and I can go into more detail uh, offline with anyone who's interested, but generally the funds that you uh, bring in, uh, any funds that you bring in through a tax assessment, they can't really be used for development or construction unless um, it's in uh, relationship to uh, making certain buildings or uh, parcels ADA compliant. Um, and that includes city owned property as well. So. You know, there's there's definitely going to be some involvement of the city if there's an abundance of city owned property in and around your district. Um, and, you know, we can we can certainly assist you with that. There's going to be a, a relationship with Common Council that would need to be formed. Whoever the council person of your district is, you'd want to get them involved um, just to let them know your plans um, so they can also advocate on your behalf as you go through the numerous approvals uh, through Common Council that you would need to do. And then uh, the New York State uh, Comptroller's Office, uh, there is an approval that's required and it's actually the municipality's responsibility to submit that approval on behalf of your bid. So there's some involvement there as well. Um, in terms of a sunset period and dissolution of the bid, so there, there isn't um, an actual sunset period um, on existence of the district. Once it's formed, it's written into the city charter and, and, it, and it basically lives there. Um, an example of this is uh, the Bailey Amherst district. Um, so the bid, the bid itself, the nonprofit can be dissolved, however. Um, and if that's something that you wish to do, 
Um, it has to be initiated by um, the nonprofit um, that you know forms forms the bid, and then um, there can't be any outstanding um, uh, indebtedness. So you know all levies that have been levied on property owners, everything must be paid up to date before a bid can can be fully dissolved. Um, and again, if if anyone needs additional information, I'm, I'm happy to provide it. Um, I wanted to bring up some really important considerations. So as you're going through the process and thinking about uh, setting up your bid, um, there's one thing that I think um, was, was brought to our attention is that people don't take into consideration that when the, ta when, when the city levies their taxes and special assessments on property owners, there's gonna be a gap in the, in the time from when we levy uh, the fees and when we collect them and then transition them over to the bid. So as you're budgeting and as you're building out your budget and your costs, you have to ensure that you've raised some additional funds uh, separate and apart from the assessment um, levies to cover your costs for your bid. And it's just one, one thing that, that needs to be considered. Um, another thing, and I did mention this before, assessments, um, while they're not taxes, they're uh, levied on property owners in the same way, which means that um, property owners could potentially have liens placed on their properties for delinquent payments on these, on these levies. Um, and you know, not that you know it's anyone's goal to foreclose on properties, but that is an unfortunate consequence in many municipalities. That you know, if you're delinquent on your tax bill, which includes this levy, you could uh, run the risk of you know having some issues in that area. So that's something to think about as well. Um, any amendments uh, once your bid is formed? Any amit, uh, amendments to the bid has to also have to also be initiated by the nonprofit. And again, you're going to need another common council approval, which is why it's important to engage uh, your common council representative um, as much as you can within the process. And um, finally, I just wanted to bring up, you know, some of the criticisms that we've heard of bids, even though, again, you know, they're, they're such a great tool, if, if organized correctly and put into practice, it can really enhance, you know, the vitality and uh, just the neighborhood feel of, of certain areas in cities, um, as well as benefit businesses and, and property owners alike. But uh, some, some folks feel that, you know, the, the existence of bids are, are a little bit undemocratic because of the fact that some of the people who actually live in those districts do not have the ability to kind of jump on the board and make and vote to actually um, decide, you know, what happens within that district and they may live there. Um, also, you know, the tenants are not required to pay uh, a bid levy. Um, it's actually the property owners that actually pay, but a lot of times the property owners will uh, have, you know, special clauses written in the lease so that the tenants end up paying to offset the cost of the levy that they're paying. And, and while that's fine and perfectly legal, it's sometimes um, because the tenant is absorbing that cost, it increases the cost of their rent. And then, you know, some of the smaller shops that, you know, pay a certain amount of rent may not be able to afford the rent in this district and they end up having to relocate. So it's almost like they're getting pushed out of a particular district, um, which, you know, some people feel is not fair. And another criticism I heard is that, um, you know, homeless and street vendors who may congregate around certain businesses and, and certain properties, you know, these, these types of um, districts sometimes uh, unfairly impact uh, those individuals who also, some feel, have a right to be, you know, wherever they want to be in the city. So it's just, I, I just wanted to give you things to think about because there's, there's a lot of benefit to bids, um, but it's a very lengthy process. And on top of that, it's, um, you know, you may receive opposition. Um, and, and I think, you know, in order to tackle that, the best thing to do is as much community and stakeholder engagement as you can do uh, prior to forming. Um, because the more, and, and, and document it, um, you know, document the notes and the feedback you received and try to incorporate all of that into your policies as you're creating your, your bid. Um, so just really quickly, uh, we don't have a ton of examples of bids in the city. Um, so Buffalo Place, I just wanted to talk about because some of you may be aware of it, but Buffalo Place um, actually uh, was uh, a bid that was adopted 
uh, through Erie County's uh, legislation. So it's not actually a bid that's adopted through uh, the city of Buffalo. Um, the city of Buffalo, it doesn't have a ton of involvement uh, in terms of you know, how the bid is actually uh, run, but we do uh, contribute, and I don't know the exact dollar figure, but we do actually contribute funding to Buffalo Place because there's an agreement for them to um, maintain the parks that are located within uh, that, that district. Um, and that's really the only contribution from the city, um, other than the fact that there may be, you know, some folks that work for the city that sit on boards, you know, within Buffalo Place and, and things like that. So they may have some impact on how things are done, but um, this is more of a, a county-led uh, uh, bid. And then again, I mentioned Amherst uh, Bailey, and I don't have a ton of information on that, but Amherst Bailey is actually listed in the city charter as a business improvement district. So it does still exist, um, but I'm not sure what the status of the board is there. So the district still exists, but I don't know what the status of the board is. And if anyone's interested to know, I can find out more information for them and provide it uh, in a separate email, or I can provide it to Syra and she can provide it to you. And then, you know, there are some proposed, I, I think some of you have expressed interest in, you know, reigniting uh, talks. I know the city has been talking with uh, some folks from uh, in the Elmwood area, um, Jefferson, and then of course, uh, Broadway Fillmore. And I just wanted to say, you know, I uh, am a resource for you all. So again, I'm going to put my information in the chat. Um, I know we're running low on time. Um, and I apologize. I actually have a hard stop at noon. I have another meeting to jump on, but um, if anybody has any questions uh, about any of the stuff that I discussed today, please feel free to reach out and I will, uh, we can set up some time to, to sit down individually if you'd like. Thank you so much, Lisa. I, um, I, we, there's more of the presentation, but let's bypass that and let some Q&A for the last three minutes for both Augie and Lisa. I will ask Kate if she could drop the box link and the survey link in the chat. So the box link has all the stuff that we talked about today. And the survey link is just the two minute survey that we've been doing. Questions yes. for Lisa or Augie? I know there's probably some questions. Not too much. Well, Augie, I have a question for you then. Um, so you were talking about four different brands, right? But two business improvement districts. So how does that get broken up? Um, so the brands are outside of the business improvement districts. These are uh, corridor segments of the corridor that are not within the boundary of the bid. Um, <clears throat> And so um, uh, in those cases, they're very general and self-identified uh, um, districts that uh, we work uh, as we have merchant meetings. We actually have merchant meetings in each of these districts. Um, and, and so uh, those, those merchants are the ones that, um, and this is over the, over the process of a number of years, uh, each of them are at different phases, um, but the, the bids, are not actually a part of these uh, districts other than the downtown. In, in the downtown uh, area where there's the light bulb and the Echuan Mesa, um, those were developed um, uh, in uh, sort of in partnership with the Downtown Mesa Association, but more on like the grassroots business area. And it wasn't necessarily a brand to represent the downtown. It was, there were more like promotional type of uh, imagery that were designed to sort of um, build um, pride and build ownership um, from the from the bottom up, from the businesses and the neighborhoods. One thing that I haven't mentioned, and I think it's critical, um, is that we often undervalue the neighborhoods adjacent to the commercial corridor. Engaging with those neighborhoods, engaging with the people who live there is critical for the success of the businesses so that businesses know what the needs of the neighborhood are and the neighborhood knows what the resources that are directly around them. Uh, and so having that, uh, that interconnection between neighborhood and business is important. And, and that's where a CDC can be a key player in, in making some of those connections. Thank you, Augie. That's a really critical piece. Are there any other questions? I know there's a lot of information today. This could have been like five different sessions. 
maybe there will be another round <laughs> with all of these broken out a little bit more. And one, I'll, I'll just add one more thing. And I, I mentioned this, but I think it's, uh, it, it's important and, um, uh, but it's, it, it's difficult, but developing uh, uh, business technical assistance programs for those businesses in our commercial corridors um, is, has been a huge, huge way for us to be able to connect provide value to businesses and get them involved in things. Um, and and uh, this work that, we, that we're doing here locally is supported by LISC, um, um, both with uh, resource and with um, capacity building. Uh, and, um, but it, it's, that's been one of the main drivers of business involvement is helping them to become better. And then they want to help you bring the whole area um, up. Thanks for that, Augie. And Lisa, I know that you have a hard stop. If you have to jump, you have to jump. Anybody can send questions to anyone here. Uh, let's continue the conversations. Please do fill out the survey form for today. Um, thank you so much. This was a, a great session, lots of packed information. Uh, Sydney, I don't know if you're clapping or if you're raising your hand. So I just wanted to ask. <laughs> clapping. <laughs> great, great, wonderful. Um, and Carl is asking if anyone wants to give the Gus Macker a whirl or to we park it for now. So uh, if you're interested in that, put your name in the chat and I can send out an email to the people who are like interested in keeping that conversation going. And if there's nothing else, we can wrap up. Brandy is interested. Okay. Thank you, Drew. Thanks everyone for coming. I'll hang on in case there's any other final questions. I'm gonna stop the recording too. Okay, great, thank you, Kate.